Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored today to have Dr. David Perez Martinez uh, to interview here for the International Light Association's uh, interview series. I'm going to give you a little background on him. David Perez Martinez is an integrative psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and sound healer, sound healing practitioner, currently in private practice in New York City. He's also an anthropologist, an ethnomusicologist, who's traveled to several countries to study the music and sound practices of other cultures. In clinical practice, Dr. Perez has totally integrated controlled breathing exercises, mindfulness meditation, sound healing practices, and physical movement with standard psychiatric care. In sessions, he utilizes the voice, breath, overtone singing, tuning forks, gongs, drums, singing bowls, and several other instruments as therapeutic tools to transform the clinical practice into a healing experience for both client and practitioner. So let me welcome you today, David. I'm happy to, really honored and happy to, to have you here. Um, Thank you so much. And I, I mean, you have, you have an incredible background, I have to say. You have a background, the professional background, and also the background of, of this talk is pretty impressive as well. So this is, actually, this is actually my living room. This is your living room. Oh, yes. I have to say, maybe you, you, you know, and it's New York City. So maybe this is your entire apartment, knowing New York City. Um, in any event, um, so, you know, you know, you're a psychiatrist and what you do is really unique. Um, could, I know that, I, I think that uh, the audience would just love to hear a little bit about your journey and, you know, how, how'd you get, how'd you integrate sound into a psychiatric practice? How'd you get here? Well, it seems that in, in my practice and everything I've done professional has actually come out of my own personal life and my own experience. Uh, somehow I've managed to take all the things that I've been into in my life and integrate them into my practice as opposed to trying to come up with them while I was practicing. So all this journey for me with sound and color started when I was a young person. Um, I remember the very first thing that I wanted to be, that I remember uh, when I was a kid was I wanted to be a singer. Oh. And when, as a young man, I also started painting. So I've always been into painting, the art and the sound and music. Um, and then when I was a graduate student, this is when the journey began more, more formally. I have been years practicing yoga, meditation, and doing a lot of chanting, uh, Indian Vedic chants. And this was just what I did for myself and for my own healing. And then I, I worked in this place that was a comprehensive healthcare facility in New York City for young people. And I had the idea to start a, a workshop using the voice uh, as a tool to help us to heal ourselves and to get in touch more with ourselves. And that idea that just came to me from what I did myself in my, in my own life. So I started th this workshop and I went to the people that employed me um, and I told them about it and they said, oh great, why don't you write something up so that we can you know, present it you know, to the whole, uh, the, uh, the administrative staff, right? And in the process of doing that, there was another person in that organization that was a, a trained music therapist who, who trained in, in, in Vermont, you know, um, and, and had a, a degree in that. And she read what I wrote and she came to me and she said, hey, I'm a music therapist, I'm certified. He goes, I didn't know you were a music therapist. Says, Where did you get trained? And I said, no, I have no training. She goes, what? She goes, oh, so you must have read so-and-so. And I said, no, never heard of those people. Well, it turned out mm -hmm. that the ideas that I put forth there were actually the leading ideas that were being used in the field of music therapy. And I didn't even know that. So that just came to me intuitively. So oh, she asked me if she could join me and we could do this together. And I said, definitely, of course, you know. And we did that workshop together. So that's how I started. Um, and all the exercises that we did there, I just made them up. You know, oh, were you a psychiatrist at the time? No, I was a graduate student in anthropology at that time at the new school. Oh, I um, see. And I, I was see. traveling uh, at that time with uh, Verna Gillis, who's a 
an ethnomusicologist and her and I formed a team and we travel in Africa and in South America and we made recordings in various countries and published them. You know, so that, that's what I was involved with. You know. So um, all of this has been an outgrowth of my own personal life. So then when I, uh, when I left anthropology and I went into medicine and I became a doctor and then I was training in psychiatry, as soon as I went into private practice, I started using the voice, breathing, meditation. Um, and, and then after a couple of years, I started using singing bowls in my mm -hmm. practice. But at that point, I had never heard of sound therapy. Um, oh, okay. I didn't even know that people were doing this. I was just doing what I do, right? And it was my wife who one day saw that there was this uh, summit meeting of, for, for, sound, for sound healers, you know, upstate New York. And, and I said, oh my God, I wanna go. I said, I, I didn't even know there were other people doing this kind of stuff, right? And I just missed it. We just, you know, they were talking about it after it just happened. So the following year, my wife again remembered and she looked it up and I went and I attended. Uh, and that was the very first time that I became in touch with other people who were using sound therapeutically, uh, who I was introducing wow. to this community. And I had the fortune at that time, one of the people that I was presenting was this man named John Belieu, who's the creator of these tuning forks, you know, um, which I use a lot in my practice here. Uh -huh. about tuning fork. And that was the first time that I actually got formal uh, instruction, let's say. But even there, I found out, for example, with the singing bowl, there was like a singing bowl master there who was talking about how they did it. And he showed how he uses them. And it's pretty much the way that I've been using them that I came up on my own. And I was like, yeah. okay, this is good confirmation of that. So since then, yeah, I started collaborating with John Bilyeu, uh, And then I began integrating more and more uh, the sound into my practice until it became pretty much a sound, uh, therapeutic sound and psychiatric practice and where I was uh, doing that work with most of my patients one-on-one -on -one live for, for quite a few years, over 10 years until the pandemic came, of course, then we started working remotely in that way. But that's how I got introduced into it, pretty much an outgrowth of my own life, my own interests, the things that I do uh, and that and and that interests me and the things that I know work for myself that I then use them, you know, to help my patients with that. Wow, I, that's, that's such a great story. I mean, such a great, so inspirational, I'm sure to many, you know, many of the people in, in this audience, because, you know, one of the things about these, this kind of work is that we sort of all do it by ourselves. And then we just sort of, and, and, and like to tell a story like that, like, wow, I never even heard of this. And then you discover <laughs> that everybody else, that there are other people actually doing it. Like, what's going on here? I, mean, I love it. I love it. Um, and um, did you feel like it was a, did you feel like it was a, uh, was it a sell at all to your patients in, in some ways that, you know, for your, for, you know, um, people who are no. seeking out a psychiatrist, you know? No, not at all. You know, I was very, very clear right, that are unlike people who are like sound healing practitioners who are out there, build themselves like that, people come to them for that. Correct. Right. Right? No one, no one come, you know, was coming to me for- That's for sure. Healing, <laughs> right, and in fact, when they walk into my office, you see all those down, you know, all this stuff is now in my living room, but all that stuff was in my, in my, in my office, which oh, I closed, really? you, know, you know, during the, the pandemic, the physical office. But people will walk in there and they see all these instruments and guns and a water fountain and, and, and plants and, you know, and, and, and singing bowls and, 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 and drums and other instruments from, you know, from other countries. And they walk in like, whoa, like, what the heck? You know, what, right. what the heck is this, you know? Um, so a lot of the times, right? I, or actually most of the times, I wouldn't even mention these things to people. They just walk in, we start talking like a normal psychiatric visit. Um, and sooner or later they go, Doc, uh, what are these things like, you know? Uh -huh. and like, oh yeah, I work with sound also, you know, with some of the people that are interested in that, you know, I use it for this and that purpose. And, you know, I would never offer it, you know, like that to people outright, except in some cases where I knew that they would respond to it and it would be you know, good in that way. And then it's usually, I would lead them to ask me to try it for them. You know, well, I like right. to try. Right, right, <laughs> right. Also keep trying to sell it. So I've never, I could say that not even once have I tried to sell this to anyone. Um, right, right. 
and 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 like everything, nothing is for everyone. I've I've done sessions on people who like they can't take the sound; they get overwhelmed by it. Uh -huh. Right. But okay, we stop. I will never do that again. You know, we'll just right. continue. Can, with can, can can you do you, do you have any uh, uh, like a clinical experience that you could share or something like that? I mean, well, well, okay. I I because I, I was thinking about it. You know. This is an interview for the International Light Organization, you know. No, 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 but hold on, hold on. It's the International Light Association, but we've we've expanded our umbrella to include sound. So, so that's why we're we're doing this. So, right, but which makes all the sense in the world because to me, I mean, sound and color are two aspects of the same thing. It's all about vibration and the level of vibration. That's the only difference. And one we experience visually, the other one, you know, the, you know. Through, through the year in, in, in that way. But I, I think I, I'd like to talk about this one because it brings the two things together. You know? Of course. And this, is right. Particular, yeah. right, this is how I started you know, working also with color. That um, I noticed right, that a lot of the times when the people are sitting there with their eyes closed and I'm playing instruments on them, where, you know, playing instruments and, and, and doing some of the sound work, that they the patients themselves started reporting that they're seeing colors uh -huh. and started asking me what about the colors you know now i'd always known about color and i'm not only as a painter but i've known about like the, the indian system the chakras you know each each chakra associated a color pair with a sound and all that and and, and that's a fairly universal way of looking at it of pairing sounds you know with with, with particular colors and all that sure. so i was a, aware of that but i didn't really and i said huh you know and so I started then exploring one particular patient who was the first one who always, always asked about the, the color and asked me, what's the significance? And that's how I started working. Her, well, well, what does that mean for you? And then the way I started using the color with the sound initially was when she's in a, in a very relaxed state, she used to tell me she would see these colors. So then on her own, when we're not having the session, when she's doing her own thing in, in her life, you're right, right? I'd always ask her to access the sound, right? Because I always... You know, we give people the sound instruments for them to try it on their own, right? As opposed to just right. come to you, right? And and think of the color and go there. And she was able every time to by accessing the color, she was able to get herself easier into that state with the sound. So wow. that, that's how I started using. And instead of also, you know, trying to take like a universal interpretation of what this color would mean or that, which which I'm not sure, you know, if I, you know, if I even believe in that, that I approach it in that way. I approach it from the point of view of what will how they feel with in a particular color. So, well, what it evokes in them or what they think it means and explore it in that way. So now we're using the sound and we're using the color also. Right? I see. As a way to integrate the two. But like everything I've done, it came from what I was doing. It didn't come from a theory. Like I didn't read about color and say, hey, this happened, right? Right. right. And it came from the phenomenon of what I was doing and, and from the patient themselves who were, you know, opening up the, you know, this other avenue. Of, of I mean, I work. think it's great. It's great. It's great because it's, because anything that happens organically is always a good, is always good. And, and that's what you're basically saying, you know, that, that this is, this is your own work and this has kind of come to you. Um, I, I have a, um, I love this conversation. I, I want to ask you about the, the anthropology piece and the ethnomusicology piece. And I, I'm mentioning it Partly because uh, for the, and for people who've watched all these interviews, the first interview I did was with Jorge Alfano, and he referred to ethnomusicology a lot as well. So, it, it, did th is this something that um, I know that you were doing it separately because you were doing it before you became a psychiatrist, right? But yes. do you feel that it, that 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 was another piece to take in that the other cult the, the, well, I, the fact that I, it was expanding through other cultures. Absolutely. So one of the things that people ask, and you might ask me <laughs> later, is does this work and all that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I always, you know, I, I'll just give a short answer and I'll get into that later. Yeah, yeah. In, into that question, but, you know, my short answer to people is no, it doesn't. You know, and right. then I ask, you know, does a car work? Right. You know, does a hammer work? Right? It's just a tool. In and of itself, it does right. nothing. Right. What makes all this work is your consciousness. That one, right. That's what makes it work. You know, 
that's what gives it, you know, the meaning, the whole thing. So the, my work in, in anthropology and ethnomusicology has contributed tremendously to all that. Because one of the things that that this was, did for me was in anthropology was to open myself up, you know, to all of humanity. The reason why I decided to study anthropology is because I'm actually, I've always been more fascinated by diversity than by sameness. Um, I'm interested in people in general. Um, and I think if you're interested in that, then you have to know all of humanity because we're not all the same. You know, we're very right. different cultures and all that, right? So I trained myself just, it was my natural, actually intuitive move to do this. It wasn't like an effort, you know, to actually open myself up to try to understand, you know, uh, different cultures. And then with the music, the music was the gateway for me to get into sound because I spent since my late adolescence, right? And, and for the, my entire life, I have spent listening to music from all over the world. There's literally no nation in the world that I haven't listened to their music to, and that I'm not familiar with, that I'm not, you know. Um, and I got to the point with music where nothing is strange to me. I, was a, I used to run a jazz club in the 80s in New York City with my friend, and it was mainly an avant-garde jazz club. And it's that kind of jazz and music that very few people could even tolerate it, listen to. And here it is music, you know. I had so many friends and girlfriends and stuff. I was like, oh, please turn that noise up, you know, down in that way. But listening to all of these things, right? And getting to the point where nothing sounds strange, where everything sounds familiar, I understand it all and I can relate to it all, right? That was a natural progression that into working in, with pure sound. Boy, I have to tell you, it's so interesting listening to you say all this and then out of nowhere, you just say, oh, by the way, I also ran a jazz club in New York City. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's, you know, I think that when we give our, our history, uh, you know, we can't say every single thing that we did, right? you know, in our lives that got us to this point. But, you know, for you to share something like that as just sort of an afterthought, when in reality, you know, it, it, it helped to kind of strengthen that basis. And also what, you know, what's jazz but improvisation and what's this but improvisation, you know, it's sort of it's kind of the same thing, right? Listen, I mean, I got myself to the point where I, I could gain as much enjoyment uh, being in the forest, listening to the sounds of the forest, right? Um, and I could, you know, go into a concert, and, and right. sometimes I, and I would enjoy that more even than going to a music concert. Right. Um, I hear it as a as a musical concert. Right. Right. So, so I have a question for you. Um, have you? I have two questions, but let me ask the first one, which is: ha Have you written at all, or, or you know, yes. published anything, um, or? Um, I haven't published that much. Um, I've been the kind of person I've been, as I said before, pretty private, you know, in my, in what I'm doing mm -hmm. and on my own up to a few years ago. But when I met John, uh, John Belia, I became interested in all this and we connected uh, immediately. So we wrote a chapter in, uh, on sound healing in a medical text, which was published a couple of years ago. And just uh -huh. year, we finished writing a sequel to that, a second chapter to that, uh -huh. um, uh, which is going to be published sometime ne next year, mo most likely. It's, it's a, another chapter on sound healing, another medical textbook. Um, but my main project for writing right now, I'm working on a book. Um, oh, really? That's a tell us about it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, because the other thing is now I'm combining my visual, right? Okay. Um, with, with the sound more so. And that is what, you know, there, there's a, a field of knowledge, let's put it that way, of inquiry called cymatic. Um, it was started by this uh, Swiss physician named Hans Jenny. And, and cymatic is, you know, he, he defined it as a wave phenomena, but what he's looking at are images created by sound or structures created by sound oh, and vibration. Right. And he did research in, into that, and this has become a big deal. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, if not most of the people in the audience know what I'm talking about and have heard about it, their organization to do this. It's a form of art also, right? Okay. And, and, and they did it in, in, in the lab, but I'm writing a book. I'm, I've done the work documenting cymatic images out there in nature, 
and in man-made structures. And I've been photographing them for a, a few years now, and now I'm writing a book, you know, to talk about. Oh, fantastic, about. fantastic. You'll have to tell, uh, you know, tell, uh, you know, if you, I, I don't know if you're a member of ELA, but if you end up joining, um, you know, you can post that book on our, our website. We'd love to, uh, I'm sure a lot of people would love to know about it. Um, well, I think I will because I, I find the organization is very interesting. You know, even, I, I love the name, the International Light Organization. It, it's <laughs> great, it's great. I, you know, we won't, we won't spend this interview talking about it so much, but I have to say, uh, it's fantastic. I, I, I joined, it. I went to a conference they did a few years ago in Europe and it was, I've hit the ground running since then. Um, we just, as a matter of fact, we just formed the North American chapter. Um, so uh, I, I have a, a different sort of question for you. Um, you shared that um, in the bio that the work changed both you and, that changes both you and the patient. Um, can, can you, uh, do you mind sharing a little about how it changes you? Well, the, the very first, I mean, the most, you know, important thing for me was that once I started really doing uh, sound in my practice all day long, right, it just changed my energy. In the right. practice. I remember that I got to a point after practicing for a while where at the end of the day, I would feel drained. You're you know, feeling what? Drained. Drained, uh-huh that I'm a little tired and emotionally. I remember I used to come home and my wife and my kids knew that they needed to stay away from me for like 45 minutes. <laughs> I lock myself in my room. I get undressed, you know, and I kind of unwind. You know, I don't want to be talking. I've been talking all day to people, right? right? Um, and, and I would, it would take me a little while to energize myself. But once I started doing sound all day, I mean, I remember I'm, I'm like bouncing back home every day. You know? uh -huh. oh interesting like i you know you know singing in the street you know every now and then you know my office is very close to my home you know mm -hmm. i run into some patients or people who know me and they see me singing like walking like whoa what's going on here you know in that way but it just changed my energy and with right. the patients also you know and i remember after a while that a lot a lot of patients i would start talking 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 right and because uh -huh. i always dedicated one hour to each patient I'm never gonna, uh -huh. I just want to see people for a few minutes and give them pills, you know. So we would talk, and a lot of them after about 10 minutes go, oh, Doc, uh, literally, they were telling me, shut up, uh, can we do sound? <laughs> uh, right. Right. That's what they want to do. Or they just want to lay out there because for a lot of patients, that's like the most relaxed that they ever get in their lives is when they're there, you know. And of course, I try to teach them to bring this out of the practice. That's the whole point of it. Right. Not just you experience when you go, there's sort of some form of entertainment, you know, but so that's right. how that. Do, do, you, do, you, do you feel that, you know, your patients, you know, got more into it and would take, would, would purchase, you know, singing bowls or songs or, you know, and, oh, and, actually, and use absolutely. it, use it, use it as part of the therapeutic process? Yes. Like, yes. Uh -huh. I actually, I started because, you know, it's not easy, to, you know. You don't just go and buy a sinking bowl, you know. Right. I, I listened to hundreds. I went to Nepal to buy sinking bowls, and I literally listened to thousands of sinking bowls, you uh -huh. know, from place to place in the factories, and just spend the hours listening and picking them out in that way. So I started buying a whole bunch of them, and I and and at first I was selling them to to patients just at cost because I was doing it as a service so that right. they could continue doing that, and then you know. I started making it more into a, a business where they would get great bowls from me, even at a right. role. And then the, wow. the, the tuning force, when I met, you know, John, then I started, you know, giving them and, uh, and selling them tuning force so and teaching them how to use it. So can I, can I, uh, can, can we jump in and can you, so the problem is, is that on Zoom, the sound doesn't really come through so well, but how, but, you know, I don't think people normally have seen tuning forks stuck into a ball like that. So what, what, what is that? Well, so, so, so th this is a little contraption, right? Before, you know, we would take the tuning forks and, and, and put them in our fingers like this and hold them, right? So that we could play. Right. Right, so, so we could play like this. Right. And then they came up with this rubber ball. Okay. Really practical, it puts them all in 
and make right. it really simple, right? And these we use, this set actually that I'm using is um, a CGFFA. Uh, those okay. four can, notes. Can you tell us why? Yeah. Um, we use these four notes. Um, actually, it's, it's a little complicated, you know, to get into the different mu musical intervals. I don't think for the space of this, you know, we have time for We that. only have a couple of minutes, but. Right. Right. So, so, but we use this one and we use this one called, you know, the Leonardo protocol, you know, Leonardo da Vinci and the Vitruvian man, because, you know, with this, we feel that, you know, these are intervals that take you from the earthly plane into higher, you know, planes of consciousness. Which I is see. what we're trying to do here, help people to shift their consciousness you know, with the sound. So these are very practical, right? We, we could use them in like this, like, like to do little sound baths or for small groups, or we could use them individually, you know, for ourselves. You know, when we listen to it and we do sessions for our, for ourselves. Um, we use all, all of these things, the bowl, wow. you know, the gongs. I love this one, the shuribad. This is the one that I, that I like to do chanting with, you know. Okay, with, show us know. everything. Yeah. We have about a minute or two left. Show us, show us, show us what you've got. Well, Anything people, else to show? I, yes, I mean, I have so many things. I have drum. This is a Japanese drum that I use um, a lot. And by the way, I, there's a lot of international instruments that I have, which I use completely the way I use them. I don't use them the way they use them traditionally, but you uh -huh. know, this little xylophone, I've used this a lot. This oh, is a fantastic. from West Africa, right? Which was purchased when I was there. Um, and it's a little tiny one. It looks like it's a little toy one, but it's not. It's right. actually a real sure sound. And it's a great one just to do little sessions with, you know, with, with people. Um, and, 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 and you walk in, so you have so many things there. It's fantastic. And then you just walk in to a session and without a pre-plan, may I ask, and, and you just sort of allow it to come? That's right. If you follow what I said, right, you, you can surmise that I usually don't go with any plans for anything. Right. I decide on the spot, on the moment, intuitively, what I'm going to do with whom, and it depends on, on, on the person, you know, and, I, and, and where the person is at on that particular day is I, you know, is I'm in, uh, in tune to, to that person and I see what's going on. Sometimes I can tell when they walk in, you know, I, we need to talk for like two minutes at most and to lay them out immediately. I had a couch and I lay them out there and, and then I, I just, you know, play for them, you know. So remember what we're trying to do here primarily. Go right the sound, Right. The main thing that we're trying to do here, right, is to alter the nervous system. Right? The nervous system is the primary target of the sound work, right? And specifically the autonomic nervous system. And what we're usually trying to do is help people to get into a parasympathetic state in, okay. in the nervous system of relaxation, Right, we're, we're growth and we, and we combine the breathing exercises with the sound, right, to do that. So to create a real physiological, you know, and a real emotional psychological effect. You know, I can talk about chakras, energy, you know, energy center, auras and all that stuff and how the sound m m might affect that, right? But at the end of the day, the only thing that I can talk about with certainty, right? And that I can say, right? And it comes from my medical training also is how this kind of work affects the nervous system right. and combine also by the way with sound because sound also affects your nervous system right it's all processed here in the brain right so this is what we're trying to do when we work to alter people's nervous system and to get them because most of the people that are having issues or problems right they're in a sympathetic kind of state too much adrenaline in their system and they're walking around with a sense of danger or apprehensiveness uncomfortableness mm -hmm. restlessness right? They can't settle down. Their mind or racing, you know, that they're going. So what we give them is the antidote to that, to help them, right, to break through to the other side, parasympathetic state, and during the day to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system. So oh, you don't have a predominance of uh, sympathetic activity, anxiety, nervousness, or parasympathetic, you know, and you're too relaxed and, uh, and chill when right. you need to perform. So that's what we're trying to achieve here to, you know, to create that balance within people. And we use the sound, the color, and all of those things, as well as the talk, right? You know, and, and, and putting things in the right perspective, you know, for people um, doing 
the, the therapy, right? Dispelling people of whatever distortions that they have in their way of seeing things so that they can bring balance up to themselves. Fantastic. Well, I, I have to say, I, I want to thank you so, so, so much. And uh, I have to say, you're my first uh, interview that I've done with where you were actually sitting on the floor. You know, if not, obviously, this is, this is, this is your mode. Um, anyway, yeah. thank you so, so much for doing this. I, 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 uh, I really, really appreciate it. It was terrific. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks. Be well.